Here's an overview of 10 of the hallmarks of cancer as published by Hannah Hannah and Weinberg in 2000 to 2011. And these illustrations were made by my wife. These hallmarks are characteristics that are shared across the large spectrum of different types of cancers and that are crucial to their success. Here's a list you can pause for overview and we'll go over each one briefly. One, self-sufficiency in growth signals. Normal cells require growth signals to grow, divide, and survive. Examples of growth signals are estrogen, insulin, and epidermal growth factors. These growth signals can be viewed as a sort of cellular allowance or cellular hull pass that allows cells to function and grow. Our body has developed this system so that growth and cell division become dependent on external control, which makes sense. In periods of stress, such as in a shortage of oxygen or glucose, not all cells have to grow and divide. Normal cells stop growing in an absence of growth signals. On the other hand, cancer cells are able to produce their own growth signals, autocrine signaling, or they can enforce normal cells in their environment to produce growth signals, paracrine stimulation, or they can express spontaneously, constitutively, active forms of growth factor receptors, thus making growth factors unnecessary altogether. In this way, cancer cells can disinhibit growth and keep dividing and growing. There are drugs that specifically target this disinhibited growth behavior, such as inhibitors of growth factor receptors, e.g. tyrosine kinase inhibitors. These can target constitutively active forms of this growth factor receptor. An example is imatinib, brand name Gleevec, which is used in leukemia. 2. Resisting cell death. Normal cells can be deactivated when necessary. Programmed cell death. Cancer cells don't care for these programmed cell death rules. They avoid it. They avoid apoptosis. Now let's talk about apoptosis. A cell that should not survive, for example, because it is so severely compromised due to DNA damage that it may behave adversely, is put to trial for apoptosis. And what's important to realize is that apoptosis doesn't just happen, it's a sort of in-body judicial system with a jury that decides on the fate of a cell. It's a sort of tug of war between pro-apoptotic and anti-apoptotic factors, which are proteins such as BCL2. If there's severe irreparable damage, especially DNA damaged, tumor suppressor proteins such as P53, also known as the guardian of the genome, will make sure that the pro-apoptotic proteins are in the majority, prompting the cell to die. Where normal cells behavedly face their fate, cancer cells influence the juries and judicial system. The tumor suppressor, P53, is often homozygously mutated, loss of function, in cancer. Also, cancer cells can carry mutations in genes for anti-apoptotic proteins, such as BCL2, rendering their expression higher. So these are gain-of-function mutations. There are anti-leukemia drugs that inhibit this mechanism. For example, the BCL2 inhibitor, venetoclax. Other drugs are the PARP inhibitors, such as Olaparib. PARP is a protein that plays a role in DNA repair. PARP inhibitors make sure that DNA cannot be repaired so that DNA damage becomes so severe that apoptosis has to occur despite the cancer cell's efforts to circumvent it. In other words, PARP inhibitors amp up the severity of the crimes committed by the cancer cells so that the cellular court will rule against it. 3. Enabling replicative immortality. Normal cells have a predetermined number of cell divisions before they retire. This number is known as the Hayflick limit. This limit exists because the outer ends of chromosomes, also known as telomeres, become shorter after each cell division of somatic cells. After a limited number of cell divisions, approximately 50, a limit is reached. If another cell division occurs, this can lead to the truncation of a gene, rendering it dysfunctional with potential dire, potentially dire consequences. This is why cells, of which the telomeres have been fully used, undergo apoptosis or they go into a retirement mode, known as senescence, where they live but they do not divide. How do cancer cells go about enabling replicative immortality? They have abnormally high expression of a normal protein known as telomerase that can lengthen 
telomeres. In doing so, they can behave as germline cells or stem cells, replicatively immortal. The gene that codes for telomerase, telomerase is TERT, which is overexpressed in many types of cancers, for example, due to gain of function mutations in the promoter region of TERT. There's ongoing research on telomerase inhibitors for cancer treatment. As of now, in the Netherlands, where I come from, none are approved. Four, insensitivity to growth inhibiting signals. There aren't just growth stimulating signals, like a salary, but also growth inhibiting signals, which can be compared with a belt that limits cell growth and division. Normal cells can only unfasten their belt when it's allowed by the body so that they can grow or divide. Cancer cells don't care about this belt. Two important growth inhibitors are the proteins RB and P53 that can pause the cell cycle in response to, for example, a lack of nutrition or due to cell damage. In many cases of cancer, the genes for P53 and or RB are mutated so that the response to such adverse conditions is inadequate. Cancer cells continue to grow and divide. Another form of growth inhibition is the phenomenon of contact inhibition, which is a mechanism whereby cells stop dividing if they're in close contact with other cells. Connecting proteins such as cadherins and integrins play a role in this process, which results in cells only forming a monolayer on a basal membrane. Loss of function of these adherence proteins can lead to a loss of contact inhibition, which results in clumps of cells that are also capable of escaping their normal location. They're more invasive. 5. Inducing angiogenesis. Normal cells have a moderate supply of blood and thus oxygen and nutrition. Cancer cells, on the other hand, attract large amounts of supply. They achieve this by inducing the production of new blood vessels through a process known as angiogenesis. This can be achieved by the release of growth factors, such as vascular endothelial cell growth factor. There are inhibitors of vascular endothelial cell growth factor, such as the antibody bevacizumab, which binds and neutralizes this molecule. Bevacizumab is already used as an adjunct for treatment of cancers of the breast, lung, and colon. 6. Activating tissue invasion and metastasis. Cancer cells can detach themselves from the original tissue that they grew in, and they can move to other parts of the body. This is either through direct extension, spread through the blood circulation, or the lymphatic circulation. This way, they can colonize distant organs where the cells divide, causing compression and damage. Now, how do cancer cells achieve these invasive capabilities? Multiple ways. They lose the function of cell glue proteins such as E-cadherin. They directly break down their environment using destructive proteins such as matrix metalloproteases, and they can be attracted to distant organs through chemotaxis. The latter may sound a bit cryptic, but it's easy to understand. Cells in organs such as lymph nodes, lungs, liver, and bones secrete so-called chemokines, substances that can attract cells towards them. This process is called chemotaxis. This is a normal function that plays a role in physiological processes such as wound healing, where the organ emitting the chemokines is expecting granulocytes to arrive. Cancer cells can increase the expression of chemokine receptors, thus more effectively seeking out organs for tissue invasion. These unfortunate, unfortunate chemokine-releasing organs are up for an unpleasant surprise. 7. Deregulating cellular metabolism. Cancer cells have highly peculiar energetic behavior. In the presence of oxygen, normal cells burn glucose in a highly efficient matter, oxfos, rendering 32 energy molecules, ATP. Despite the presence of oxygen, cancer cells decide on burning the same molecule of glucose in the highly inefficient manner, called anaerobic glycolysis, that renders just two molecules of ATP. In order to compensate for this low return per glucose molecule, cancer cells burn heaps of glucose. This phenomenon is known as the Warburg effect and it's baffled scientists in the previous decades. Why would cancer cells seemingly unnecessarily choose this inefficient way to burn glucose? We now know that this effect benefits cancer cells because the anaerobic glycolytic pathway provides certain byproducts such as amino acids and lipids that are useful building blocks for cells. 8. Evading immune suppression. Normally, the immune system attacks aberrant cells. That's potentially bad news for cancer cells. That's why cancer cells deflect the immune system through multiple mechanisms, including reducing the number of points of recognition on their cell surface or by actually producing proteins that directly inhibit immune cells. 
An example of such an immunity inhibiting cancer substance is programmed death ligand 1, PDL1. This binds to the programmed death 1 receptor on leukocytes, thus suppressing them. Why does this PD1 receptor on leukocytes even exist? Well, since the immune system is quite a potentially destructive force, there are multiple checks in place that can inhibit it. Cancer cells simply hijack these checkpoints to their advantage. There are drugs that antagonize such checkpoints, checkpoint inhibitors, thus boosting the immune system to fight cancer. For example, the PD-1 receptor antagonist, nivolumab. 9. Genomic instability. Cancer cells are unstable magicians that continuously think of new ways to mislead normal cells and our drugs. That's because cancer cells are inherently genetically unstable. There's a constant stream of mutations, deletions, duplications, and chromosomal restructuring. That's because multiple DNA repair mechanisms are defect and not repaired in cancer cells, and, as we discussed, apoptosis doesn't occur. Not all these mutations are beneficial to cancer cell survival, however. Some are neutral and some are even deleterious, reducing cancer cell fitness. However, for the cancer population as a whole, this genomic instability is the basis for a Darwinian Walhalla, where the cancer cell population becomes highly adaptable to selection pressures. This adaptability applies both to selection pressures from within, e.g. hostile white blood cells, or from outside, the drugs we use to attack the cancer. This genetic instability can have multiple root causes. An example is mutation in tumor suppressor genes, such as BRCA1 and BRCA2, which are common in breast cancer. 10. Tumor-promoting inflammation. Cancer cells like a chaotic environment. By inducing inflammation, the cancer cell creates an environment that is beneficial for its survival and spread. How do cancer cells cause inflammation? They can release pro-inflammatory substances, cytokines, that promote immune cell function. Also, they promote angiogenesis, which can be likened to building highways that allow the tanks and artillery to arrive to the scene. The local inflammation breaks down the matrix around the cell, allowing it to spread more easily. Also, the inflammation releases substances that are harmful to DNA, such as reactive oxygen species, thus contributing to the genetic instability that benefits the population-wide Darwinian adaptability of cancer cells. There's evidence that simple anti-inflammatory drugs, such as the NSAID and spirin, can reduce the risks for several types of cancer. Since these non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs can also cause bleeding, renal function disturbances, and gastrointestinal ulcers, the risks and benefits of utilization of these drugs is subject of research. I hope you found this video helpful. Please do like, subscribe, and share.